the risen Christ, love paid the highest price. You are the sacrifice on the tongues of men and angels. You split the raging seas, you set the captives free. Grace came to life inside of me. Our God is always able, and you are the power, you are the mind. Thank you. 
today as people who are seeking you, wanting to know you more and know you better, know ourselves more and better as well. And we're here in a spirit of worship because you are worthy. You are worthy of our worship. That though we may look around at our world and things that are going on and and, and there may be pain and suffering and, and, and lots of struggle, Lord. We still know that you are on the throne. And we cling to the hope that one day you will make all things right. And Lord, for that reason, we praise you today. And, and, and Lord, we, we gather in this space and, and those worshiping online where, where they are too, but we're joined with something bigger something beyond ourselves and our small stories. We're joined with the story you are at work writing around the world, that people around the world are in worship today for one reason alone, and that is for you. And we're united in, in spirit. Some are gathered in bomb shelters. We lift up our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, Lord. We continue to grant them hope and, and peace, Lord. There, there's people that are, are gathered in homes, some that are in a, a places where it's illegal to do so. And Lord, we know that they gather for one reason alone. There's people that are gathered in steeple buildings and auditoriums and restaurants and open fields. And we're gathered to worship you, Lord. And we know that you are here among us, you are in this space, but that you also go before us, that when we leave this building and these spaces, we don't leave you. You are our God, our Emmanuel, God with us. And for that, we praise today. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us, Lord, speak to our hearts, fill us, Lord, with your spirit today, that we may know you more that we may be challenged by you, that we may be encouraged by you. And Lord, we lift all these things up in your precious name, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. Well, you all can take a seat. And any children are welcome to uh, go to our children's ministry. Pastor Becky is at the back, ready and waiting to bring you back with the other kids that are present here. And once again, welcome today. We are glad that you're, that you're here. Go ahead and watch this. Good morning. How's everybody doing today, by the way? Good? A thumbs up? Some like, some like this, some like everything down. Those of you guys online, go ahead and say hi in the chat box. And 
I uh, will comment back and welcome you too. So I know it's been like a crazy time of year, isn't it? We just have, we've had lots of events and things going on in the life of the church and I know in our personal lives too. And so I'm really glad that you've chosen to be with us today and chosen to take this time to come together to, to worship. And hopefully uh, you received one of these on your way in. This is our uh, worship guide here and there's some notes inside. Uh, Becca's going to bring your attention to a couple things coming up and little act, some activities and events later, but this is for you. You can follow along if you so choose, uh, count down to lunchtime, whatever you want this to be in the notes that you are welcome to do so. And there's also some questions too at the back that you can reflect on to after the message um, and during the week. So um, we are in the fourth week of our Lenten sermon series, Were You There? Visiting the places that Jesus visited and frequented and uh, because we believe that like Lent is this, this season leading up into Easter, 40 days, excluding Sundays, and it's a journey. It's a journey towards discovering more about ourselves, about who God is, about who this Jesus is, and what he's done for us. And so we've been visiting these literal places, these places in Scripture that Jesus went to, and... Um, for those of you that have been with us, uh, just a little recap. We started in the wilderness. The wilderness, Jesus was baptized in the wilderness by his cousin, John the Baptizer, the Baptist. You know, not, he wasn't a Baptist, but he was the Baptizer. And he was sent into the wilderness, tempted for 40 days and 40 nights. Then we visited the town of, anybody remember? Capernaum, Capernaum, the town of Capernaum, where Jesus kind of centralized his ministry. That was kind of his hub where he worked out of, and it was the place of healing. And we talked about healing, and we talked about how God still does it, but he also does it in different ways, and sometimes ways that we don't expect. And then last week, we visited the other region that nobody wanted to go called Samaria, and we met the woman at the well, Samaritan woman there, and talked about the places that we try to avoid and the places that we don't want to go, but how Jesus, Jesus makes it a point he had to go there and amazing things that happened there. Well, today, today we're visiting another place, and that is the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Galilee. A couple weeks ago, we said, are you a mountain person or a beach person? Well, we're visiting, we're going back to the sea, but we're going actually back to the sea, not to a specific town. By the way, ne next week we're going to visit the mountains, make all the mountain people happy, so surprise there. But the Sea of Galilee is a place of uncertainty. It's the place of uncertainty, the place that we don't know what's going to happen or what's going to transpire, kind of like the weather yesterday that we encountered four seasons it's in the midst of a couple hours. Uncertainty. Are you in the midst of uncertainty? Because there's all kinds of feelings that come with uncertainty, isn't that right? Uh, I mean, I don't know about your March Madness bracket, but there's a lot of uncertainty about what has happened there. There's a team called the Peacocks. Who knew that they would arise to the front? But kind of capping off on this, this theme of the, the sea as being the place of uncertainty, I was thinking about this this week, just reflecting on like how, you know, making the, these connections and all, and what came to mind when I was thinking about the sea first were a couple of favorite boat movies. Favorite boat movies with boats and the sea and all the unexpected things that take place there. So I thought in the theme of March Madness that we would make a kind of head-to-head -head bracket style uh, competition here. So I'm going to ask, we're going to compare one movie to the other, and those of you that are, would vote for one or that you think that that should win, I'm going to ask you to either raise your hands or shout. Um, however you feel, and we'll kind of see how they compare. So you'll kind of get what I'm doing um, in a minute. So Titanic or Adrift, which one? Have you, have you seen them? Okay, so who's, who's Titanic? Say, yeah, the boat, the big boat sank, right? Or Adrift, like little boat, like, I'm not going to give that away. Anyway, it's a good story if you haven't seen it. Okay, we have a, a couple hands. We have the Titanic. Okay, Titanic takes that competition. Okay, what about the next one? Perfect Storm or the Hitchcock classic lifeboat. If you have not seen that, put that on your to-do list, okay? So Perfect Storm or lifeboat. Alfred Hitchcock, fan of the birds, right? Okay, that was kind of very close there. I, th I think we still had our Perfect Storm 
winning there. And last but not least, where the big fish come from, Ah, Jaws or Moby Dick. The book and the, there's like 10 movies, by the way, that Moby Dick has been in. He's very, very famous. So Jaws fans, yeah, done it, done it, right? Or Moby Dick, the whale, yeah, that stole it all, that started it all, I would say. That was very, very close, too. I think we still had our Jaws fans winning there. But, but you think you kind of group all these movies together. Uh, what's something that they all have in common? Water, yeah. Bad things happen in water, right? Don't go there. Things sink. You know, there's, it's unpredictable. There may be things coming out of it that are going to eat you and take you away because the sea is a scary place. It's a scary place. And actually, in Jesus' day, get this, it was seen as, the, the sea was seen as kind of this abyss. It was a symbol of chaos, even a symbol of hell, because it changes quickly. It changes quickly. It sudden has sudden storms and violence. It has these beasts that arise out of it. It's very unpredictable. And there were cultural stories that actually depicted the sea as this monstrous beast in and of itself. And, and different religions actually had gods who would battle themselves together in the sea because the sea is a place of uncertainty. But we're also going to see, though, the sea is also a place where we encounter Jesus. We encounter Jesus, and, and not only the uncertainty and the change that happens there, but that it's a place where we can be changed. Because sometimes in the waves of uncertainty, we discover our true direction. So let me describe for you a little bit about Galilee itself, the Sea of Galilee, because this is one of Jesus's favorite places. Like I said, he kind of centered out of Capernaum, but he loved the Sea of Galilee. It's actually mentioned in the Gospels about 40 times, believe it or not, 40 times in the stories. But the Sea of Galilee, there's a kind of map to give you a location of it. Uh, It's not actually a sea, but it's really a huge lake. It's a lake about seven to eight miles across, 13 miles long, about 40,000 acres total. And in biblical times, it had four different names, depending on who you were talking to. You know, sometimes around, like even around here, like you drive around, there's a street that changes names four times. Well, it was kind of in the same way. It was known as like kinneret. The kinner, word kinner is the Hebrew word for harp. It kind of looks like a harp shape, believe it or not. Uh, Lake Genesaret, Lake Tiberius, or the Sea of Galilee. So if you ever read those in the Bible, they're all the same thing. They're all the same place, just depends who you were talking to. And, and the way it got water, it was fed from, uh, there's a mountain to the north, Mount Hermon, and so it would prov- that would provide all the cascading water to, to fill it. But also you see there's a river that flows into the sea, and that's the Jordan River. It flows from top to bottom. And, and it flows out the south point. And so it kind of forms this invisible line through the lake. And so fishermen would speak of that line, this invisible line, and call it, when, when they would travel across the lake, they would say they were crossing over. And you might see these words over several times in Scripture, moving, moving from one side of the lake to another, going from Capernaum to Bethsaida. And so Josephus, who was interesting, he's a first century historian who wrote lots of records about different things going on at the time. And, and he depicts the Sea of Galilee as this flourishing economic central of fishing. And he recorded that there were about 230 boats at any one time who were working on the Sea of Galilee. What's also interesting about the geography is that there was segregation going on. Segregation of different people of different faiths and backgrounds. The Jews typically lived on the northwest side of the lake. The Romans and the Greeks, they lived towards the south and to the east. They lived kind of the region of Tiberias. Then we had the Romans and the Gentiles who also centered on the east side. That was kind of the place that was called the Decapolis, the the area of the ten cities or ten towns. And that was mostly a Roman and Greek influence. There were a few Jewish people And I believe it was also the site of lots of bacon plants because there were no Jews around, had there been. There's actually a story there that Jesus goes over there, a story where he casts out demons from this dude and and they go into pigs 
That's why there were pigs there, because they were not Jewish. They were actually ate them. But for Jesus, the Sea of Galilee is where he starts calling his disciples. So we're going to look at the Gospel of Luke today. Luke is one of the Gospel writers for Counts of Life and Ministry of Jesus. And Luke tells us this, starting in chapter 5. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. So kind of parallel here. Parallel here. Uh, We see that the the sea is this place of uncertainty, and yet we see people crowding around Jesus there. And I I dare say, I think sometimes on the shores of uncertainty, that's the place that we come to Jesus. Is that so maybe in your life, part of your story? In times of loss or in struggle, um, in times of of need or something that happens of, of tragedy, on the shores of that uncertainty is often when we turn to Jesus, because we realize that things are out of control, and we can't do it by ourselves. Uh, it's many a story. Many of us have kind of faced those times. But the, the story continues in verse 2. So he saw Jesus. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, also known as Peter, and asked him to put out a little further from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. Well, I think when it, when it comes to facing uncertainty, I think when it comes to, to facing uncertainty in our lives, I think we recognize from this story that in the midst of that uncertainty, Jesus wants your boat. Jesus wants your boat. So Jesus stopped and begins to teach. And you imagine there's all these crowds gathered around him, well, what's the thing? He didn't have a microphone. Nobody could hear him. You know, everybody's trying to look over and see what's going on and listen. He couldn't hear him. Well, the solution, if you didn't know this, this is kind of cool, but water provides great acoustics. And especially in this region, there's kind of a slope that goes up on the beach. So if you're kind of standing there and somebody is out in the water, it's a great acoustic formation. You could probably hear a lot better. So Jesus is kind of imagining framing this in his mind. But to do so, he needed a boat. And the scripture tells us, Luke tells us, he saw two boats on the shore there. And one of them belonged to Simon, Simon Peter. And just to give you a picture, this is kind of, well, this is the remnants of it, but this is kind of like what a boat looks, looked like from Jesus' time. It was actually back in 1986, there was a drought in the Holy Land. And um, in the region of Galilee, there was this big muck like lake uh, where part of the lake had been. Well, somebody saw an object emerging from it or there in the mud, and it turned out to be a boat that dated all the way back to 2,000 years, Jesus' time. So this is kind of like this, the structure of what that was. And, and it's interesting because even historically, in different writings of the time, Greco-Roman writings, the boat was a symbol of the state, of the state, of the nation. And the sea was a place of peril that was always driving at it. But, but we see from the story what, he do, what Jesus does, though, in verse 3. What, what does he do? He sees these two boats, and he gets into one. He gets into one. That's normal, right? Like, no conversation, no lease agreement. Um, if you don't think that's weird then I want to invite you today after church, I want you to go find the nicest car that's around here. Pick a nice one. I don't want you to pick the blue Corolla. That's mine. Um, And I want you to just like get in because sure in a crowd this size, somebody's left theirs unlocked. And then when they see you in the car, when they too come out of church um, and they ask you, what are you doing in my car? You just say, well, I noticed that you came from Table Life Church and I need a car to use. Um, Can you please give me your keys? That might convince you. But that's like essentially what Jesus does here. It's really, really awkward. It's really, really strange. He sits down in this boat that's belonging to somebody else. It's belonging to Simon Peter. Why did Jesus do that? Why did he pick Peter? There was a second boat, right? You ever thought about that? Well, I think I can think of a lot of reasons why I wouldn't pick Simon Peter. I mean, if you're God and you kind of know everything, there's a lot of reasons why you wouldn't pick him because he was impulsive, he was a know-it-all. If you read further in the scripture, he gets pretty violent. I mean, you don't cut off an ear if you had a normal upbringing. (laughs) 
He has a filthy mouth. He's just kind of crazy. And I, I once heard a preacher say, their reasoning was, because Peter was bold. He was bold. That's why Jesus liked him. I don't think so. <laughs> Jesus picked Peter, just like us, because he had a boat. You have a friend who has a boat. You want a boat, but it's like, I'm going to get the friend who has the boat. Jesus picked Peter because he had a boat. But, but the bigger story, though, that's going on here, if you zoom out, Jesus' method of working is through creative collaboration. Sure, he could have walked on water. He didn't need a boat. But here is the creator partnering with his creation. I mean, if that were me, yeah, I, if I were Jesus, like, I, I'm not Jesus. But if I were, I would have, like, walked on water, you know, gotten more attention, started stirring the crowds. But that's not what he does. Instead, Jesus is like, no, I want somebody's boat. I want a boat. I want his boat. I want her boat. I want to use their life. I want to use their weakness. He says, I want to call people together who are all different from races and nations around the world and different backgrounds. I, I want your boat. I want somebody who owns their own business, some people who are unemployed. I want people who suffered great childhood abuse, people with filthy mouths, and I want perfect students. And I'm going to bring them all together because I want to use their boat. I want to step into what they have. So I want to ask you, what do you have? What do you have that, to invite Jesus to step into? I mean, I think a bigger question is, if you were a boat, which boat would you be? What kind of boat would you be? I put this little poll out on Facebook earlier this week, but this is several choices. There's five choices among them. Would you be, show of hands, would you be a kayak? Would you be a kayak? Easily maneuverable, sensitive, like through white water, all sorts of stuff. Would you be a motorboat? Would you be a motorboat? You kind of speed through, you get things done, you're super fast. What about a sailboat? Be a sailboat, you kind of you're breezing back, right? Letting get things go, go with life. What about the cruise liner? Any cruisers here? Yeah, yeah, not Titanic. Not Titanic, right? We're not going there. But, or, or the duck boat. Your life's a duck boat, right? They kind of drive on the land and then they sink in the water. It's, it's really nice. I asked this question, and several of our worship leaders also gave a response. One said that he is a pontoon boat, slow, um, but always a party. <laughs> Can you guess who that is? There we go. <laughs> a show of hands. That's Ben, Ben, who is, who is up here. We had another worship leader who said that she is a giant ship full of great things sinking slowly. <laughs> okay, that's Danita. Is that the piano here? But, but you think about that, you know, we laugh at these things, but, you know, however your life, whatever the boat is that kind of characterizes your life right now, sometimes we have to ask the question, you know, why would the one who walks on water have any use for my boat, right, for my life, for who I am? Well, I was thinking, once again, that question about Jesus' need for Peter's boat. I, I, I was pondering this and praying about this, and then it hit me because I, I went from thinking that Jesus needed Peter's boat to realizing that Jesus didn't need Peter's boat. Peter needed Jesus in his boat. See, there were two boats on shore. Had Peter said no, he probably would have chosen the other one. See, Jesus, God does not have to use us, but he desires to. That, that creative collaboration. He gives us opportunities to partner with him in building his kingdom here and now. It's been said he doesn't want to change the world without us. I was thinking about how this kind of even has happened in my own life. Um, even, you know, I've been, grew up coming to church, and, you know, there's always this time. We don't pass baskets here anymore, but there's always, like, that offering thing. And for many years, I thought that, like, an offering was to keep the lights on and to keep the bathrooms clean, because those two things really, really matter, right, in the church. I thought that God needed my boat to keep things afloat in a church, but a little bit of life rolled by, and I realized that God was God even before I showed up, and I realized that I needed him, that my giving was a way to invite Jesus into my finances. This was less about the church and keeping lights on and more about, about my boat, about what I was inviting Jesus into in my life, to transform my view of, of money, to transform my view of what generosity looked like, 
to invite him into what I had. And I reflected on this, and I realized that if we don't want to change, if we don't want to be transformed, then the best thing to do is just to keep our boat to ourselves, whatever that is. To divide our church life, our religious life, however you want to characterize it, from the rest of our life. To say, okay, the church thing is what I do on Sunday, and then the rest of my life is away from all that. Or we have the choice to let him in. And I dare say, when you do, when you invite Jesus into all aspects of your life, watch out. Watch out. Because God is at work in all places and all times, and our job is to pay attention to what is he doing. What is he doing around us? And to get involved at those points. He's in need of a boat. Okay, okay, Jesus, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you what I have. I'm going to partner with you. And the thing is, he doesn't care if your life is like the Titanic, or if it's sinking slowly. He wants to use us. But I think moving on in the story, I think also in the times of uncertainty and facing uncertainty, I think Jesus also shows us: don't give up. Don't give up. But rather, go deeper. Go deeper. So starting in verse 4, the story continues. When he had finished speaking, he's remember, he's preaching from the boat now. Peter let him do this. He has finished speaking. He said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon, Peter answered, master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I'll let down the nets. So this is a little puzzling for some of us because uh, fishermen, they would mainly go at night to go and catch the fish. And it was very, very smart um, in the first century. Actually, till today, they still do this. Because when you're using big nets, especially ones that kind of like, you know, aren't these like uh, fiber, whatever, special fiber optic things that people use now. Um, but if you're throwing out big nets into open water, fish can see them. They're not that stupid. But at night, they can't. At night, they can't. And so they would go out. It was kind of like the night shift, right? Third shift. They're out there all night, and they would fish that way. And so Peter, he just got back from a full day's work. It's morning. Peter had been fishing all night, and it wasn't a good one. You ever have a day that you just want to be over, especially when work, right? You're just, I'm just done. I want to be over. That was Peter. That was where he was at this point. But now Jesus turns to Peter, and he calls him, and he says, I want you to go back out there. Not only that, I want you to go into deep water. You can imagine Peter like, what, right? This is not the time in broad daylight to try again because the fish, they're going to see the nets and this is going to be a disaster. But also think about this. What profession was Jesus? What, what profession did he grow up in? Was his, his daddy? He was a carpenter, Joseph of Nazareth. He was the carpenter. Peter is probably, Peter probably be like, he, like your, your talk was really good, but we're the professionals here, Jesus. You do the preaching, we'll do the fishing. I mean, if, if there's one thing any professional, whether you're a plumber, electrician, whatever, is something you hate, it's being told how to do your job, right? You invite them over to your house, and you're like, okay, well, I Googled that, and I saw that on YouTube, whatever, and they're like, yeah, you know, if you've been in that position, you're like, really? Like, you're the expert, right? Why are you inviting me over? Well, it's like the same thing. That's where Peter is right now. But yet, yet, he does it anyway. See, Jesus doesn't often give details, but what he does give is direction. He gives direction. He says, put out into deep water. The deep water is that symbol of unexplored areas of potential beneath our perceived limits. See, it's easier for Simon at this point to stay on shore. But yet, he says, but, but because you say so. And we have to give him credit here. We have to give him credit because even with a bad attitude, he still obeyed. So think about that. God can bless obedience even with a bad attitude. So, I, I mean, even those of you guys that work out regularly, you go to the gym or you're a runner like me, like there's days like you don't want to go, Right? Maybe that's like every day. I don't know. But it's like every day. You might, you're not in the mood for a workout, but yet you do, and your muscles still get received the benefits. And I think that's often for us, too, when it comes to our, our relationship with Christ. Uh, you might not even feel like coming to, to church, but yet God may still speak to you. Has that ever happened to you? 
So a uh, question of honesty. How many of you didn't feel like coming to church today, right? Yeah, okay, good. You're honest, right? Here we go, all right. I love you anyway. That's all good. That's all good. But seriously, like there's times it's like, I don't feel like doing this. I don't feel it. I don't feel it. I don't feel it. But the obedience, God blesses. He uses. And then the story continues. It's interesting. So Peter obeys. And then when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come in, help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. You know what's also interesting about the Sea of Galilee? The Sea of Galilee is 700 feet below sea level. It's actually the lowest freshwater lake in the world. It has an average depth of 84 feet, but in places it goes to 150 feet. So I think there's a little bit of significance here. Perhaps there could be certain significance to the fact that Jesus picked the lowest point to do a miracle. He picked the lowest point. Not only that in the place in the world, but he picked Peter's low point. He chose to do this ministry at this place, not because it was the closest, but I think because it says something about a God who often chooses our lowest moments and our weakest places to do his greatest work. And I have to say, I've seen this. I've seen this in you. In your stories, I've seen this so many ways in, in my ministry. Even with those of us that may consider create, be creatives, right? You're in the, the arts, you, create, you write music, you write poetry, you, you, you're a writer. You know, those that are creatives, just when you're about to throw the work away, that's when you begin to see what it was meant to be all along. To go deeper, to go deeper. To go deeper, instead of giving up to say, you know what, I'm not just going to stick this out, but I'm actually, I'm going to grow. I'm going to grow from this experience and grow in my relationship with God. There was a time in my life when I had moved back home after, um, after going to uh, medical school for a year and felt like a total failure. And I have to say, in that time in my life, I was submitting job applications, one after another, after another, after another, and... Nothing seemed to happen. I wound up working at a daycare part-time and then waiting tables and trying to put things together. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I decided one day, someone had told me about this position. I had been in the science field. Those of you, many know my story. I was an environmental scientist um, way back when. But, but even before that, I was interested in biology and in the environment. And someone had told me at a, uh, one of the places that I had visited that there was a job opening with the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. And lo and behold, I said, I was ready to give up at that point because I'd submitted like literally 100 applications. If you've been there, you know what that feels like. And so I did. And lo and behold, that job interviewed me and said yes. And the funny thing is, I didn't know how to fish or boat. It's a problem. It's a problem when you're in that. But they brought me anyway, which I consider looking back a total God thing, right? And, and, but it was, the ball was in my court, I, I could have not submitted that application. I could have said, okay, well, I'm just giving up right here and there, here and then. But it's interesting because here I am many years later, and though I may not be fishing and boating, I'm doing something similar. I'm creating environments for people to fish for people, for people to make a difference in others' lives. And so maybe for you, maybe you have things in your life that you're just about ready to throw away. Just when you're putting up the boats, just when you're walking away from that marriage or you're ready to quit praying for your kid or you're ready to quit religion and church overall or making friends or investing in people, but yet God is saying it's not over, not yet. Because many times at the edge of our greatest transformation will also be the place of our greatest frustration where Jesus says, go deeper, let out your nets. And the story could have ended there, but it doesn't. This is important. This is the wrap-up here. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled up their boats up on the shore and left everything. 
and followed him. Times of uncertainty call us to take a step of faith. What does Peter do? He drops his knees. He says, depart from me, Jesus. I know who I am. I'm sinful. I don't, uh, I don't deserve this, he's saying in other words. And the sea does that, doesn't it? It causes us to doubt ourselves. It brings up things inside of us. But Jesus, he realizes, is more than a carpenter and a teacher here. He's seen something terrifying. He's seen the power of God. It kind of echoes what happens in the book of Isaiah when Isaiah is faced with face, facing the Lord and, and yet he hears the Lord calling him and the Lord asks, whom shall I send? And Isaiah says, send me, send me. Jesus says, do not be afraid from now on. You will fish for people. It's interesting. When we take a step of faith, Jesus meets us where we are but he doesn't want you to stay there. There's always an invitation. There's something more for you and for us and for our community to begin to follow Jesus closely, to take a step and say, God, I'm trusting you with this. Even maybe before you believe, just as Peter did, he didn't fully grasp who Jesus was. Even before you believe who Jesus is, to take a step of faith anyway. To draw this together, sometimes in the waves of uncertainty, we discover our true direction. Uncertainty. The sea is not a bad place, even though there may be unknown and uncertain characters and and there may be storms that arise and there may be creatures that come up. But yet Jesus shows us that he has been about change all along. Meeting people at the sea bringing outsiders in, and inviting the Peters among us to join him in the work he is doing. Are you paying attention? Are you paying attention? Are you on the shore of change or uncertainty? Jesus wants your boat. Don't give up. Go deeper and take a step of faith. Because we just may find ourselves part of a story that he is writing, a story that's bigger than us, a story of redemption. But it's all by grace. It's all by grace. It's not what we do, but it's us receiving grace. And here at Table Life Church, we celebrate the table together each week as a response to Jesus, knowing that that as we come forth to receive uh, the bread and the cup, we're receiving something that has been done for us, that we did not achieve. It's not about doing 100 million things to be a good person, and then we measure up, and we're good with God. But it's saying, hey, you know what, God? I don't cut it. I don't make the cut. I need you. I want to trust in you. I want to receive your grace. And so Jesus, the chapters later in the story, Peter and, and his, his, the other disciples, they begin to follow Jesus closely. And for three years, they do so. And, and the story goes that, that it's all summed up, though, in a moment that leads to the cross. A cross that Jesus would subject himself to. But before he got there, he invited his disciples as part of the custom, which was a, a Seder meal, a celebration of the Passover. When they gather around a table, just like we do with, with family, with, with friends, A a table that he met them where they are and invited them to, even though the future was uncertain where they were going. And yet he promised them that he would be with them every step of the way. And so together we join in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Grace. It's a place, it's a table of forgiveness, a place to to meet Christ, to recognize that we need him in our lives and to ask him to go before us. And so as part of that meal that Jesus had with his disciples, he took something ordinary, just as he takes us, ordinary people, and he took bread and he blessed it, and he broke it and said, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this every time you eat it in remembrance of me. 
And at the end of the meal, he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this, all of you, and drink it. This is my blood which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this every time you drink it in remembrance of me. And he said, Every time you take this bread and drink this cup, be reminded you are not alone. You are not alone. I not only walk with you, but I go before you. And, and this, this table is a foretaste of the tables to come. The table that Jesus has promised that we will gather one day with those who have gone before us, all the saints who have gone before us around that heavenly banquet table. And what amazing celebration that will be. And though the uncertainty in the future is, is ahead of us, we can see to the end of the story that God has written. And so let's pray together that that may be so. Lord, pour out your spirit on these gifts, on this bread and this juice, Lord. That, that your spirit may, and your presence may be among us, Lord. And we ask that you would pour out your spirit on us, Lord, your people. People in need of you, in need of your grace, in need of your love. Who are called by you to step out of our boats and to follow, even in the times that we don't even know where we're going, Lord. Help us to see you, to receive you, to know that you meet us where we are. We pray this all in Jesus' name. So I'll invite those who are serving to come forward. Um, here at Table Life Church, um, we have an open table, which means that you are welcome to join us here and that you don't have to be a member of Table Life Church or a certain denomination or go through a certain class. All you need to come forward and to receive is to say, I want to receive God's grace and, and to say, I, I, I want to receive that here today. And so um, we'll be receiving by intention. So one of our servers, uh, they'll take a piece of bread and they'll dip it into the cup of juice for you. And if you would just come forward and to receive like this. Um, if you don't feel comfortable receiving, know that that's okay too. That you belong here and you can sit back and you can enjoy the music and know that you belong. And those of you guys online too, you are welcome to participate. You can grab some juice and some bread or some crackers and know that you are just as much a part of this worship as we are who are gathered here. So come forth and receive the body and the blood of Christ.
near Well, good afternoon. I'd like to welcome all the many guests we have here today and online. I apologize to all the online people. We do have a Facebook Live going for my cell phone currently because the camera stopped working. So um, I'm so glad you can still hear me. I checked the audio and I will post a better video later today. Um, so for most of you who aren't aware, this is the part of the service where we learn about um, the things that we can do to join in the kingdom of God um, outside church. It's still a part of worship even after we leave the doors. Um, so um, those things encompass many things like uh, being connected to our church and filling out a connection card and letting us know you want to be connected or uh, tithes and offerings if you're a regular attender um, or uh, just being a part of the prayer chain and getting a text every Sunday and finding out who needs prayer and how you can serve those people. Um, but also things you can do in the middle of the week um, or next couple weeks. Um, there's a lot of them coming up. As you know, we are currently in Lent and um, Easter is coming. Um, thank goodness because it's a busy season and I'm ready for an egg hunt and the Easter Bunny will be here. And um, But we love Jesus too, right? <laughs> All right, so coming up is um, Easter Extravaganza and that's on April 9th. And so if you have littles from 10 and under, even babies, we're going to be having age-appropriate egg hunts. So no children would get trampled. Um, there will be plenty of people on duty to make sure the older kids don't fight over eggs. There'll be plenty of eggs. We already have about 900 donated so far. We would like to get another 600 if you guys can help us. Uh, we will need some Easter eggs filled. You can bring them to the church anytime during office hours, Monday through Thursday, 9 to 2, or you can drop them off next Sunday here um, in the church lobby. There's a table out across from the um, broken water fountains. Um, if you do need water ever, there is a fridge in the back with bottled water always forgot to mention that. So uh, also the Holy Week, we have e we have also Good Friday coming up, and that will be here in person and online at 7 o'clock. Um, the day before that, we're not going to have any services on Monday, Thursday, but we will have an online devotion that will be posted sometime throughout the day. Um, so look for that to be posted. All you guys got to click on Facebook, and it'll, you'll get a notification saying it's there. And then on Easter Sunday morning, we're going to have a little bit of a breakfast, just some pastries and coffee, a little bit more of a spread than just, just coffee, so it'll be nice. We'll have some fruit, and um, come and hang out. We'll have some tables up in the, in the lobby, and you can um, visit and celebrate with us. Um, Easter is always a great celebration, and I'm really looking forward to being here with you all. Um, so I'd like to brag on some of our youth right now. We have quite a few who are, it's play season, and we like to gossip the good things, and some of them are here. Maddie. Maddie Hodge goes to Cedar Cliff High School, right? And she was in Phantom of the Opera, and it was a fantastic show, and I know many people here saw it, so great job, Maddie. Joe Goldsboro is not here. He's in fifth grade, but he went to the, he's at Mechanicsburg School District, and he did um, Joseph and Technicolor. Um, he was in the, the high school play, and he was one of the kids in the show, so I'm so proud of Joe as well. And let's give a round of applause for Joe. Maria, a Messiah University student in her senior year, who is also a worship leader at our church, she directed a play in her middle school. So I'm so proud of Maria. She's stepping into her teacher position quite well. <laughs> if you know of any gossiping things, not just children and youth, we have grown-ups. Um, am I missing something? No, it's just Ben talking. <laughs> Gotta love it. Um, if you know anybody who deserves a little bit of good gossiping, that's the kind of gossip we like to do here, please let me or Pastor Chris know. We love to talk about it. Um, one last thing, we had Fire Pit Friday here Friday night, and we had so many new people in our church volunteer, and they really swung it, and we are so thankful for them. So thank you very much. That's all I have for you today, but I'm going to have you stand, and we're going to sing the doxology to the Lord. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy about you, but this is quite the celebration today, celebration of Kiva Everly and what the Lord is doing in our lives and how you can say even in the midst of uncertainty and craziness and change that Jesus is present. 
And not only that, but that he wants to get in your boat. So this week, whatever you're facing, be reminded and be encouraged that you are not at it alone. So would you bow for the blessing? So go forth and know that you are loved. No, go forth and know that you belong. Go forth and know that you are called. You are called to be a light in the darkness, to show love, to show grace, to show hope to those around you. So go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Take care, guys. Have a great week. Before you leave, turn around and uh, extend the peace of Christ to someone. Introduce yourself. And those of you guys online, we'll see you guys next week. Take care. All my life, all